You're listening to the Scotiabank Market Points podcast. I'm your host, Greg White. Market Points is part of the Knowledge Capital series, a collection of audio, video, and written commentary from Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets leaders designed to provide you with timely insights and analysis. When was the last time you visited a mall or went to your office? The health reasons keeping us away are certainly temporary if we look to history, but what about the rapid adoption of technology that has crystallized the effortlessness and affordability of online shopping? Or finding that by working from home, we're not only getting more done, but recapturing precious untold hours we used to spend in traffic. In this episode of Market Points, Mario Sarich, Managing Director of Real Estate and REITs in Global Equity Research at Scotiabank, dives into sector performance and opportunity and explains how office and retail are positioned for the future. Hi, Mario. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me. Uh, so how has real estate performed uh, as a sector through COVID-19? It's been challenging. Uh, so... You know, in our client discussions, one of the most popular questions is what the heck is going on with the REITs? Why is an interest sensitive or interest rate sensitive asset class not responding better to a 50 basis point year to decline in the 10 year GOC? You know, why is a defensive asset class arguably the second worst performing one during the crisis? Uh, so it's an interesting question. You know, if we go back over time, uh, the first thing I'd like to point out is if you go back 20 plus years, uh, the REITs have delivered a 12% total return CAGR. That's uh, well above the TSX average of 8%. Uh, it was one of the best performing asset classes coming into the crisis to start the year. So in terms of what's happened uh, since February 20th, which we kind of defined as uh, being the start of the COVID crisis in the public markets, uh, I would say three things. Uh, first of all, as I just noted, the sector has had a very strong couple of years, uh, including a good start to this year. It was up 10% prior to February 20th. That was the third best out of all the asset classes. And secondly, which I think is more interesting, is that uh, we suspect or we believe that the REITs are more economically sensitive than what they're giving credit for. So think about residential real estate for a second. Disposable income is very highly correlated with home prices over time. Well, commercial real estate is no different, and it generally exhibits a pretty high correlation with residential So a strong economy equals strong appetite for workspace. It equals higher wage growth, which turns into higher spending in retail sales. So both are clearly good for office and retail occupancy and therefore rents. So one key message that I wanted to convey uh, this morning, which is what we've been conveying to clients, uh, is that the economy matters for real estate valuation. And we can't just simply look at uh, the direction of bond yield to determine what the REITs are going to do. And we spent a lot of time uh, in the past, looking at REITs and comparing how the REITs do during various uh, uh, monetary policy cycles. And a really interesting observation would be that if you go back to 1974, and we do a lot of work on the U.S. REITs because uh, we have a lot more time uh, back historically. Uh, but if we go back to 1974 and we look at how the REITs do during Fed tightening cycles and Fed easing cycles, and this may sound counterintuitive at first, but typically speaking, REITs do well, relatively well, uh, versus the S&P during Fed tightening cycles. And the REITs have typically lagged by a meaningful amount during Fed easing cycles. Typically, the Fed tightens during economic expansion and it eases during economic contraction. So, for example, in the 12 months after the initial Fed cut, going back to 1974, We've identified that the U.S. REITs have, on average, lagged the S&P 500 by an average of 9%, and they typically drop about two years after the initial cut at about 12% underperformance. This time around, if we think about it being an easing cycle, it really commenced on July 31st, 2019. And since then, both in Canada and the U.S., uh, the REITs have lagged by about 18 to 20%, so well above historical average. But we would also argue that the economic contraction that we've experienced in these uh, 10 to 11 months is also much worse than historical average. So both returns as well as the economy have been compressed in terms of a correction in a shorter time period due to the extraordinary nature of the virus. So the bad news for real estate has been that it's economically sensitive. The good news for real estate is that it is economically sensitive. And as a result, $1,000 
We think that REITs could be a leading asset class coming out of this crisis once investors feel more comfortable over the visibility of any potential second wave uh, with respect to the virus or any developments on the vaccine front. The sector we think is quite attractively valued. Uh, it trades at a 16% discount to our average NAV. It's fairly rare that the REITs trade at a double digit discount to our NAV. It's only happened about four to five times in the 15 years plus uh, that I've been at Scotia. When investors are able to get into the sector at those types of double digit discounts to NAV, your average six month total return historically has been 16%. So we think the REITs could be a prime candidate to lead coming out of this recovery if the base case scenario is indeed for a gradual continued reopening of the economy. We're all hoping for that economic recovery, certainly sooner than than later. Um, but when you think about some of the technological shifts that have happened as a result of um, this pandemic uh, and how they may change structurally, how these, um, let's say, the subsectors of the asset class behave over time. So first, maybe let's look at uh, office space and the effects of working from home in the in the future of office. What do you feel if, if the office a sector is going to recover. What's going to support that recovery if more and more people are working from home? Well, you know, uh, you know the old saying: if I had a nickel you know, for every time I read a work from home article in the past three to four months, uh, suffice to say, there's been a lot of headlines uh, surrounding the status of the office building as a central place for work. Uh, in terms of marketplace trends, uh, focusing on Canada in particular, the first point that I wanted to make is that the Canadian office market was in very solid standing coming into the crisis. Toronto and Vancouver in particular were quite strong, not only nationally, but also globally. So, for example, uh, Toronto ranks either second or third in the world in terms of lowest vacancy uh, today at about 3% uh, behind Tokyo and roughly in line with Paris. Uh, Vancouver is number four right behind Toronto at about 3 3.5% vacancy. Uh, we're seeing strong or we have seen strong tech demand in particular drive Toronto and Vancouver rents higher. Well, Montreal is also showing positive momentum or was showing positive momentum in terms of occupancy and rents, uh, ranked number nine in the world in terms of lowest vacancy at about 7%. So relative to the global gateway peers, uh, we would argue that the uh, Canadian office market was in relatively good position uh, coming into the crisis. Uh, the second point that I wanted to make is that when we look at uh, rent collection uh, during the crisis, it's been fairly strong for the office REITs thus far, exceeding 90% uh, in April, uh, which ranks pretty close to industrial and well above retail rent collections that we'll get into later on into the call. So if I come back to the work from home headlines, which uh, which is what you're referring to, uh, we think it's likely that there will be some negative impact on office demand from working from home. That said, another point that I want to make is that it's also very early and extremely hard to quantify what that impact could be. Tenants are currently almost exclusively focused on ensuring employee safety and proper reentry into the workplace, while landlords are also equally almost exclusively focused on helping tenants with their reentry needs. Uh, so the overall message is that it's very early to quantify the impact to office demand particularly considering most office leases have many years uh, to go prior to expiry. Uh, we have read a couple of interesting articles uh, trying to quantify uh, the potential impact. Uh, that being said, and uh, one interesting one that we saw was an estimated 8.5% impact to office demand over eight years. So call it roughly 1% per year on average. Uh, that said, uh, historically, or if we look back over the past 20 years, there may be some counter points to that. Uh, so over the past 20 years, occupied space demand in Canada has roughly averaged about 1% in terms of growth. Uh, that has been despite a 20 to 30% reduction in the average square footage per employee uh, allocation. So we've seen more employees uh, being put into less space overall. And while we're not proponents of that substantially reversing over time, we do think that intensification uh, trend um, may uh, may have come to an end uh, as a result of the crisis, so that going forward, uh, general economic growth uh, driving 
business expansion needs uh, should better translate into office space growth all is equal relative to what we've seen the past 20 years. Uh, so that could be a bit of an offset in terms of the work from home uh, acceleration. Uh, net net, we still do think it's uh, a bit of a headwind for the office space, but perhaps uh, the office REITs have already uh, reflected that in their valuations, uh, given the corrections that we've seen to date. You were mentioning the Canadian cities, uh, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, having uh, strong office markets uh, coming into the pandemic. Uh, but there, of course, is lots of uh, development. I'm thinking of Toronto specifically. Do you see any threats to the absorption of, uh, of new inventory coming down the pipeline? Uh, that's a good question, Greg. So uh, I would say that whether it's commercial or residential real estate, in order for notable declines in asset value to occur, it typically requires simultaneous demand erosion and supply growth. So we've talked a little bit about the potential uh, demand trends going forward. On the supply side, when we think about the office market and focusing on Toronto in particular, it's roughly about an 85 million square foot market with uh, approximately 10 million square feet of uh, GLA that's under construction that we estimate about 80% pre-leased. Uh, that's a pretty meaningful pre-leasing level, number one. Uh, number two, a good amount of that pre-leasing has come in from outside of the downtown core, so from the suburbs, uh, midtown Toronto, new tenants to Canada. The average expected completion for the construction is late 2021, so it's still some time out. Uh, so perhaps one silver lining for the office market is that uh, we were also aware of a potential, call it shadow pipeline, that could comprise 10 to 15 million square feet on top of what is under construction today that we suspect is more unlikely to go ahead now. Uh, so these would be projects that are seeking zoning approval or seeking a lead anchor tenant to kickstart construction and would have been slated for completion in 2023 to 2025 or so. So the silver lining in our view is that uh, there may be less supply pressure going forward, all is equal as the new supply perhaps responds to uh, the changing in demand patterns that may originate uh, coming out of uh, work from home uh, trends uh, from the crisis. So net net, uh, we continue to believe that uh, the Toronto office market can be a solid one over time, uh, particularly if uh, supply expectations are adjusted. Turning to uh, retail and thinking about inventory and uh, future use, uh, is has this pandemic caused an issue for uh, enclosed malls? Is this the death knell? The, the pandemic uh, has, in our view, accelerated trends that we were seeing already take place. Uh, and so e-commerce uh, has become or has taken an increasing share of total retail sales uh, over time. Uh, Canada is catching up to global peers uh, in that regard. Uh, retailers have been very focused on omni-channeling in terms of strategy and all of that uh, we think is just accelerated uh, as a result of uh, what we're seeing today. In terms of trends within the market, uh, we would point to Canada in our view being more defensively positioned uh, than we might see in the U.S. Part of the reason for that is that we just simply don't have as much retail in Canada. So if we look at the enclosed mall square footage per capita in the US, it's roughly 24 square feet per person. Uh, in Canada, that number is closer to 16. Uh, so that's one aspect. Uh, the second aspect, when we look at the retail re universe in Canada, uh, it is typically uh, comprised of the ownership of value add retail, grocery anchored retail. So the overall exposure within the retail read space in Canada to enclosed malls uh, is relatively low uh, on the margin. And the enclosed malls is where we've seen uh, more pressure, uh, certainly relative to grocery anchored retail or value oriented retail uh, in terms of rent collections, uh, for example, simply because of the inability 
to stay open uh, during the crisis, which uh, increasingly more and more malls are opening up, uh, which is a positive uh, all sequel. Uh, so we think that the crisis could accelerate those trends. Uh, in addition to that, we think there could be increasing focus going forward in terms of repositioning retail. Uh, so the retail REITs in Canada uh, have spent the last several years looking through their portfolios and identifying opportunities to add uh, residential real estate, for example, to existing uh, mall footprints. Uh, all of the, or virtually all of the REITs have highlighted very substantial potential long-term residential development pipelines that could comprise uh, anywhere between you know, 50 to 60% to over 100% of existing gross leasable area uh, at the malls or at the retail properties. So this is a longer term, fairly substantial opportunity to enhance value uh, over time. Uh, the emphasis being on long term, uh, it takes a while, as you may know, uh, to get the required zoning uh, or rezoning for a change in uh, type of use. And it also then uh, will take some time to actually build these residential towers. Uh, so net net, it may take some time, but that process was already underway. And we think that the crisis will uh, further accelerate that process uh, going forward. The, the crisis has also introduced, of course, all this uncertainty. Um, and with, at these sort of price levels then in the sector, are you anticipating some consolidation or a lot of M&A activity? If we look back uh, to the global financial crisis as uh, a barometer, and, and clearly they're, they're not the same thing, but it was a, a shock to the system, a different type of shock, more of a financial shock uh, than an economic shock. Uh, in our view, uh, what was interesting was that M&A or consolidation activity uh, fell off pretty sharply during the crisis. And we would attribute that decline to two things uh, in particular, uh, notwithstanding the REITs at the depths of the GFC trading at roughly about a 40% discount to our NAV. And for what it's worth, that 40% discount to NAV was something that the REITs hit again uh, during this crisis back in, uh, in March of this year. But notwithstanding the cheap valuations, what we think prevented more consolidation activity at the time was uh, first and foremost, a lack of pricing visibility. Uh, and so it was difficult to determine what the financial crisis, what kind of an impact it may have on cap rates, uh, for example. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the availability of debt capital uh, came down uh, fairly meaningfully in our view. And the availability of debt capital was one factor in our view in terms of driving consolidation. So when we compare what we're seeing today relative to what we saw during the global financial crisis, you know, it, it took about 12 to 18 months uh, post global financial crisis uh, for really transaction activity in the private markets to open up again. And so we're in that period today, in our view, uh, there's been very few large direct transactions in the market that can provide price discovery to some extent. Uh, when Perhaps difference today versus the global financial crisis is that the availability of debt capital seems to be a bit better uh, for the broader markets, not not solely for the REITs, but for the broader markets as well. And that's evidenced by where triple B spreads uh, to you know corporate bond triple B spreads to the ten year. Uh, that gap uh, is uh, meaningfully lower than what we saw during the depths of the GFC. So it it seems and feels like the credit markets are functioning better today than they did uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so net net valuations, as we mentioned, do look attractive. We think there is a period of price discovery ahead of us. And in terms of availability of debt capital, we think it's relatively good uh, for the REITs, but we also think that there's a period of, of price or kind of 
discovery on that front in terms of uh, the amount of availability there will be going forward. That was Mario Sarich, Managing Director of Real Estate in REITs in Global Equity Research at Scotiabank. You can find more thought-leading content from Scotiabank on our website at gbm.scotiabank.com, and you can also follow us on Twitter at ScotiabankGBM, as well as our LinkedIn showcase page under Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets. Please refer to our legal disclosures on our website. Thanks for listening.